Saturday is looming as one of the worst days for bushfires in the Bidinham. records and the forecast for Ash Wednesday, even the amended forecast on Ash Wednesday, is not as bad as what's being forecast for Saturday. As an old bush bloke, you can smell the heat, uh, and, and you could certainly smell the heat that day. It, by 10 o'clock, there was a strong smell of eucalyptus in the air, which means that the, the leaves are opening up because it's hot. Um, it, was, it was windy and it was hot and uh, you could see a, a heat haze right across the district. So it was, uh, you knew it was going to be a real bad day and, and it didn't, once something started, it, it took off and, and it ran and it, it, it really moved very, very quickly. You woke up early that morning and I walked out the door at six o'clock and at the moment you walked out the door, I thought, holy hell, something will happen today because it was so extremely hot at six o'clock in the morning and the wind was a really hot, strong wind already. And everyone was on tenter hooks that there would be a fire of some sort. So everyone was just sort of waiting, hoping that nothing would happen. And the morning went by and it was fine, but of course by afternoon, all hell broke loose. Large clumps of black material that had already been burnt was falling all over the place. And it was quite frightening because you were looking around everywhere trying to think now, where's the fire going to start here? When the fire was coming towards us, the ember attack was like, it was hailing, but it was hailing embers on that day. Uh, the roar of the wind was incredible. It was like you're standing behind a plane and you could barely talk to each other. And then the last thing that happened was a, a big mob of kangaroos come through and nearly took a few of us out while they were trying to escape for a period of maybe five to ten minutes. There's two of my firefighters that were unaccounted for. We didn't know their location. You can't help but think what worst case scenario is there. And it's just absolutely gut churning. And that was uh, something that will always stick with me as probably the worst part of that day. That helplessness, that's not what we're used to. We're used to, day -to on a day-to-day -day basis, attending emergencies and events and bringing those to a conclusion. Uh, we couldn't do that, so it was abnormal for us. Uh, we're making decisions where we couldn't really use our skills and our equipment and help people, that we sort of had to move on to something that we could achieve. So it was a real conflict, um, really, of what we're used to doing and making some tough decisions at the time. Uh, that feeling, come back to that feeling of helplessness. Like fire intensity is measured in uh, kilowatts per linear metre. Ash Wednesday, it was 108,000. The predictions on that Friday night for the Saturday was 130,000. So that told me that the f if a fire started, it couldn't be stopped. I got a phone call from the uh, regional duty officer saying that um, they don't have the capacity at the OMT to manage this fire. Um, the group is going to have to manage it and uh, we'll see what happens. So that, that left me sitting there as the incident controller for the Bendigo fire, which uh, was a new concept. One stage there, I took a, a breath and walked outside and just to, you know, and it was extremely, it was, and, that was the only way you could work out the air conditioning was working, is if you went outside and realised how hot it was. To my right, I could see the Reedsdale plume, a very big plume, and to my left was the Eagle Hawk plume. And then that's when I knew for the fact that we were in real trouble. You know, we had, it was coming straight at us, the Eagle Hawk fire. Gardens around my house had, had were burning and the uh, pergola was on fire, but. The actual front had gone. I've got a uh, sprinkler system around the back of the house which uh, spread the fire and just pushed it around the house so we we're lucky that we never lost the house. I got a call from the wife saying that she needed a fire tanker quickly um, and I didn't have any to spare and I had to tell her no. Lost shedding and uh, farmland only one animal and um, yeah, a lot of hay and whatever, but um, nobody was injured. And that was my biggest concern of the whole fire, that um, we, we might um, you know, get somebody into trouble, but uh, we were lucky enough that everybody was safe. As soon as the Pomonet captain said that it had jumped the highway, I knew we were in trouble. And it was just a matter of 
focusing on getting structures in place and getting tankers into safe positions. I tried with my driver and penciler to get towards the head of the fire and as I went down Carter's Road the fire met me and there was, I knew the area and there were a couple of tankers were heading down the road and I called them back to where I was into a, a paddock with no grass in it and the fire burnt under us and I'm quite sure if, the, if I had let those tankers go down Carter's Road that we would have had big trouble. Yeah. So that's the one thing I do remember, getting those tankers on the safe ground. When the fire crossed the highway, it burned through my brother Terry's farm and my parents. Um, my father got stopped at a roadblock and wasn't able to get home. And um, uh, my mother and <coughs> my mother and um, uh, granddaughter took shelter in the dairy and the fire burned around them. Uh, but Dad always said that was the worst day in his life. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. And we were getting information about how the day was evolving and I started to get a bit nervous about just what was ahead of us, or ahead of me personally for the day, but ahead of us. It wasn't long after that the deployment came and um, and I suppose we were just, we were in fire mode, like we were, we were starting, I was starting to think about, you know, what the day was going to bring. I was thinking about my own house and, and how we were situated as far as safety. I was thinking about my family, you know, we live on a rural property. I think I went home and checked all of that and then that was about the time that we had before we were deployed and I was off. We wouldn't have driven that far south and then the fire actually jumped the highway in front of us and that was the other environmental thing is just, just I, I had never seen fire that big, like 12, 15 metre high flames and it, it jumped the highway as though it wasn't even there. Like, we look at the highway as a significant fire break, well it, it was nothing, it was, it was a blip, it was just nothing. Um, the, as, the, as the fire hit trees they just exploded and that was all in front of us and that was, that was probably, that was just the real moment that I realised how well, where we were going and the situation that we were in. We could see all the smoke rising coming towards us um, and it was pretty tense. Like we sat around, in all honesty, we weren't talking. We were just sitting there waiting for it all to happen and um, yeah, it was, a, yeah, it was a really tense moment because we didn't know how fast it was going to hit us. We knew our escape route, we knew we had to get out, where we could get out when we needed to, if we needed to. Um, we just simply didn't know what it was going to be like when it hit us. I think the day was one, as I've used before, it was enormity. Um, I think it was a wake-up call for a lot of people, a lot of members in the community about how we can be impacted and how fires affect us. I think it was a wake-up call to ensure that we better prepare for emergencies because unfortunately I, I think these sort of events are going to reoccur again and unfortunately more often.